Hello, my friends. I'm Pastor Mark from Family Worship Center. Thank you. Thank you for letting me spend time with you again today. I've got some encouragement for you. This is going to be a time of a little reflection and some deeper thought, but some some encouragement that's going to help you live life to the very fullest. So if you're ready, I want to encourage you to get your Bible. Have it in hand. And also, if you'd like to, yes, you can download the notes from our website, i-fwc.com. Of course, you will find not just the PowerPoint there and the notes, you'll also find the message both in audio and video available for you as well. You can catch on to those links, or you could also copy those links and send them to a friend who might really be encouraged by what we're going to share together today. Well, if you're ready, we're going to head into the sanctuary for a powerful message on numbering your days. As I welcome you home, yes, welcome home, welcome home to Family Worship Center. And as you are, you want to open to Psalm 90 and verse number 12, Psalm 90, 12. But first I need to tell you about this man who's walking by this mental institution, and he hears a sound on the other side of this fence, and he can't figure out what's going on on the other side of the fence. But he keeps hearing somebody saying, 88, 88, 88. You see somebody bouncing up and down. 88, 88, 88. He keeps walking around trying to figure out what it is. So he sees there's a hole in the fence. So he goes to look in the hole in the fence. And as soon as he looks in the hole in the fence, so he pokes him right in the eye. <laughs> he's, Whoa, what's that for? And all of a sudden, he sees the guy jumping up and down again. 89, 89, 89. <laughs> Numbering. <laughs> Numbering, yes. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing with you today part number one. I'm going to talk to you about telling the time. I'm so glad I get to be here and share this with you. Um, yesterday didn't quite work out the way I expected. I had a wonderful week. I shared some of that on Facebook. Wonderful week. You know, Jesus took time to get away from the crowds. At times, he took his disciples away, like to Caesarea Philippi. I took time away. I got a free airline ticket, so I had a chance to get away and had a fantastic week. I finally got a chance to, in quietness, look at my life and say, what are my goals going to be for 19, or excuse me, 19, yeah, <laughs> 2019. And so I was able to go over my goals for the year and look at goals for myself personally, goals for ministry, what I want to see happen at church. I had four different messages that came to me, and it was just like, oh, yes, and putting those things down and planning things out throughout the year and started the revision on the Synoptic Gospels, doing a second edition and writing new devotionals in there. And it was just a fantastic week, so many wonderful things. And I had it all planned out. I would be home by four o'clock yesterday, and that just no problem at all, right? Until I got on the flight in Tampa, and we didn't take off. And the pilot comes on and says, we're having communication problems. Something's wrong with the computer. So we're having a technician come and then another announcement, and another announcement, and a delay, and delay, and delay. So I landed in Detroit three minutes after my flight to Green Bay. And it was the last flight to Green Bay. So my app is telling me, we have rebooked you. You will be home tomorrow, Sunday, at 9 p.m. I said, no, I won't. <laughs> that doesn't cut it. I will drive from Detroit to Sturgeon Bay if I need to. Well, worked out. I got booked on the last flight, the last seat to Appleton. And a firefighter that I met along the way graciously drove me from Appleton to Green Bay to pick up my truck. I got in my truck, and of course, I, I planned to be in bed by 9 o'clock. 
I arrived home at 11 to this snow. <laughs> that is a four-letter word. <laughs> and I think this is not a problem because I bought my wife a Christmas present, a snow plow for the front of the truck. <laughs> so I put the plow down with confidence. I just, man, I'm going to get this snow out of the way. Push that snow that the plow had already, you know, pushed up at the end of the driveway. Push that over, put it into reverse, and <laughs> spinning tires. The first push, and I'm already stuck. <laughs> it's like, ah! <laughs> I managed to get out. I managed, and I thought, I'm going to have Zach just do worship. I will set my alarm, and I'll come later. And 6 o'clock, I woke up. Time to go to church. I'm so glad I get to be here and spend this time with you. We need times in our lives where we take time apart, and I did that this week, to take that time to reflect, to pray, to focus, to, to renew vision. And today I'm hoping that what I share with you is going to help place you in a mindset where you're also able to receive, to look ahead, and to take the moments which God has given you and get the fullest out of them that you possibly can because Jesus came to give you life and that more abundantly. We're here telling time together. In Psalm 90 verse 12, it tells us, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I don't want you to look at a clock. I want you to look at your life. Where is your life right now in the schedule of time? Now, this is the only psalm that we have in the New Te- or excuse me, the book of Psalms that is a psalm of Moses. This isn't David. This isn't Solomon. This isn't the... the some of the other worship leaders who gave us these songs, because that's what psalms are, they're songs. This is a song that Moses wrote. Moses also was a, a singer. And he gave us this song, and I'm sure that in the time and the seasons of his very long life, he also felt sometimes on that backside of the desert where he had time to look at his life and say, where am I really at? What is really important? What is my life really all about? What is meaningful? What's valuable? You see, the purpose of being aware of our lifespan is so that we will make better decisions with how to use our lives. I want you to think about that. Because we tend in our lives to number many other things, but we... We don't tend to number our days. We don't tend to think about where we are in the calendar of life. Some of you, you just got the calendar open. Some of you, you're in springtime. Some of you, you're enjoying the summer of your life. Some of you, well, you've, you've hit fall. Some of you don't even realize it, but you're on the last page. Where are you in the calendar of your life? In your lifespan, if you will, the average lifespan in America is 79 years. 76 years for males, 81 for females, used to be more, but the more that women are involved in the things that historically are roles of men, their lifespans are shortening. So what do you got left? What do you got left? Well, I'm 60. <clears throat> Some of you, you got most of your life left. Some of you, you got a lot of time ahead. And that's awesome. Some of you, like me, <sighs> you've drunk a lot of the life to where there's not as much left now. I'm 60, so if I live to be 79, that means I have 24% left in my life. That's it. If I go by 
Statistics, I have 6,900 days left. That's it. And those days go very quickly, don't they? In fact, the shorter, the less there is in the glass, the quicker it seems to go, doesn't it? The days are just going by so, so much faster. And how much you've got left? Hmm. Need to think about that. <clears throat> Somebody else did. His name was Jenks. I have his devotional here. This particular edition is uh, from 1806. Anybody have that when you were a kid? <laughs> no, nobody's that old yet here, right? No, this is that the older than Moses would be. Yes. In Jenks' devotional, he has a lot of different devotionals for different seasons in your life. And this particular devotional is called A Prayer for Preparation and Readiness to Die. That might seem like, Pastor, that's a tad morbid. No, it's not. Because let me tell you something very important about life. Until you're ready to die, you're not really ready to live. It's when you have faced death and you realize that death has no power over you, that you have an eternal life promised by God, delivered through the gift of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and that you have eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life started right now. I'm already living an eternal life. I will shed this body and that's it because I'm still going to be alive. When you realize I'm ready to die, then you're really ready to live because death no longer has a hold over you. Jenks says this. He says, Lord, what is our life? But a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Even at the longest, how short. And the strongest, how frail. And when we think ourselves most secure, yet we know not what a day may bring forth to turn us out of it. Nor how soon you may come before we are aware to call us to our last account. Quickly, shall we be as water spilt? to the ground that cannot be gathered up again. Quickly snatched away from hence in our place, here we shall know it no more forever. Our days, one, one after another, are spent apace, and we know not how near to us is our last day. When our bodies shall be laid in the grave and our souls called to appear before the tribunal of God to receive our standing doom for bliss or for woe eternal. Yet, O oh good God, how I have lived in this world as if I should never leave it. How unmindful I have been of my latter end. How improvident of my time. How careless of my soul. How negligent in my preparation for my everlasting condition. So that thou mayest justly bring my last hour as a snare upon me. To surprise me in you know, all my sins and my unpreparedness to appear before thee. But oh dear Father, Father of mercies. Remember not my sins against me, but remember thine own tender mercies, and thy loving kindness, which have ever been of old. Oh, remember how short my time is, and spare me that I may recover my strength before I go hence and be no more seen. Make me so wise as to understand and consider my latter end, and to remember also myself the shortness of my time. And teach me, teach me so to number my days that I may apply my heart to true wisdom. Lord, what have I to do in this world but to make ready for the world to come? Oh, that I may be mindful of it, intent upon it, to finish my work before I finish my course. 
That's a good devotional. That's a good call, a wake-up call, because all of us need to consider how many days do we have left? How many days do you really have left? Because it could be snatched away just like that. Today could be the end. We need to face reality. <laughs> my, <laughs> my wife loves to say, stop taking life so serious. You're not going to get out of it alive anyways. <laughs> Yeah, she's right about that. We're all going to die, aren't we? Unless the rapture happens, we're all going to die. But death doesn't have to have control over our minds, over our hearts. Jesus faced death head on, the real thing. But this life, these frail bodies, even in their incredible strength, a little tiny aneurysm, you're dead. Cut off in oxygen for a few minutes, you're dead. That heart stops beating, you're dead. How frail and how short life is. It's like water spilt to the ground that you cannot pick up again. So we need to apply our hearts to wisdom so we make some good choices. You need to make some good choices. And that's why I want to tell you you need to practice some priorities. Let me give you some priorities to practice. The first priority I want you to practice is this, and it's an important one. I want you to value every single moment that you have. I want you to treasure the moments that you've been given. I was thinking of this last night as I was stuck in Detroit. I was supposed to have left already at 340 or whatever, and there I am, and not even going to leave until almost 9 o'clock at night, and I'm thinking, all these hours, what am I going to do? Well, I spent $29, because I would have had to buy supper anyways, and checked into the Delta Sky Club, and had supper there, and was able to work there, and to study there, and took advantage of what was a bad time to be a good time, to value those moments and those hours as if I'm still going to be on retreat. I'm still going to enjoy these moments. I'm still going to take this. In fact, we need to realize that there is a special name for the moment that you are living in right now. It is called the present, isn't it? You're living in the present. And we need to see the present as a gift that we are to cherish every single moment. That means you have to be careful to not let the garbage distract you because it will if it can. Oh, it will if it can. Two Wednesdays ago, I was on my way to church. I was thinking, this is just going to be great. I love going to church. I just love church. I love being with you and worshiping the Lord. And it's just really great. I'm on my way, and I'm thinking, I need to do one thing on the way to church. I am going to stop and visit some people that somebody from church told me about, and I'm going to invite them to church, but they have a really long driveway that they can't find anybody to plow it out. So I'm going to plow their driveway out for them. I think that's a great way to, you know, do something kind. Jesus fed them first and then invited them into relationship with him, right? So I'm going to plow the driveway. I take my big plow. I plow out the driveway. And I'm thinking, this is really great. Praise God. He's able to chat. And now we're on our way to church. I'm on my way to church. And I'm driving out of their very steep driveway that now has no snow on it, but is covered with ice. And my nice four-wheel drive, dually diesel, instead of going forward, starts going backwards. <laughs> Smashing the rear fender, got the estimate, $2,400. <laughs> and I said, it's your truck, God. You busted your truck, God. <laughs> I wasn't going to let that moment destroy the moment, the present, the gift. <clears throat> so I called the tow company because I have towing insurance. They're going to send somebody to get me pulled out, no problem. Fortunately, you know, one tire went over the embankment, but the plow caught on a tree. Otherwise, I would have gone over the edge and flipped the truck and totaled it out. 
So I'm just hanging there precariously on the edge. And as, as the towing company says, we'll send somebody out. And a few hours later, church is over. I watched online and got to be enjoying it. But then a few hours later, I call. I say, you know, nobody's come yet. I need to get this towed out. And they said, well, we can't find anybody to tow you out. So we decided to deny the claim. I said, no, wait a minute. It doesn't work that way. You can't do that. They said, well, you're stuck in the driveway, and we don't have you get out if you're just stuck in the snow in your driveway. I said, I'm not in my driveway, and I'm not just stuck in the snow. My truck is disabled and smashed up, and I'm over an embankment, and I, it, it is disabled. I have to get pulled out. And they said, well, I suppose. And they Finally, it's 11 o'clock at night when I got pulled out six hours later. <laughs> and I could have let that steal my joy. But I told God, it's your truck. You're the one who orders my steps. So if you want me to not make it to church and have a smashed up truck trying to do something good, that's your problem, and I'm just going to enjoy being with you. But preserving a good attitude is not easy. Don't let others steal your joy. Now, that is not easy, but that's essential. Understand, that is not an easy thing to do, is it? Because you're going to have things that are going to challenge you. I happen to really like my truck. I think I have the coolest truck in the world. It might be 17-year-old truck, almost 18. <laughs> but I like my truck. It might have just 800 miles short of 200,000, but I like my truck. But I can't let my truck own me. I have to own it, not let it own me. You understand that? We have to change our perspective to an eternal perspective and a perspective that you're ordering my steps and I'm just going to go with it and see what you've got for me, God. Let me just take this a little further for us practicing the practical. I want you to treasure the moments, cherish the moments, and practice the practical. Now, I'm going to tell you something that you didn't know before, something that is really, really cool. There is the word pragmatic, the English word. Be pragmatic. You've heard that expression. Well, the word pragmatic happens to come from the Greek word pragmatic. <laughs> Yeah, it's an English word that comes from the Greek word. The word pragmatic comes from the Greek word pragma, which means having the habits you need to accomplish what is necessary in a reliable way. That is so important, so good. You need to hear that again. Having the habits that you need, behaviors that you do over and over again are your habits. Having the habits that you need to accomplish what is necessary in a reliable way. That's what being biblically pragmatic is. Now, I want to clarify something very important. This is not the same as the philosophy of pragmatism. The philosophy of pragmatism is not biblical. The philosophy of pragmatism says whatever works the end justifies the means. And the Bible says, no, it doesn't. You do not do something that is unbiblical because you think it's going to lead you to what you want. The end does not justify the means. Not in biblical pragmatism. But I'm not talking about secular philosophy. I'm talking about what the Bible teaches. Because the Bible actually teaches us that God wants you to have the habits that you need to accomplish what is necessary in your life in a reliable way. That's being biblically pragmatic. Now let me just put this in the context of Scripture because this word is found all over in the Bible. And in Luke chapter number 19, you remember Jesus had the parable of the talents, or the minas as it's also said. He gave to one so many talents, another, another. And then he said that the Lord went off and said, I'm going to return eventually. Do business till I come. And that word business in the Greek is the word pragmatusaste. Comes from the root of pragma. 
It means that you are to, until Jesus comes back again, you have been given gifts and responsibilities in life. And until Jesus comes back again, he wants you to have the habits that will help you accomplish what is necessary in your life in a reliable way. He wants you to keep working, keep living, keep doing what is necessary and have healthy habits to accomplish that. Another place you see this is in Matthew chapter 18, verse number 19, where Jesus says, whenever two or more of you gather together and you agree on a matter, that word matter is the word pragma, from the root there, a pragma. You're agreeing on something. You're agreeing on the habits necessary to accomplish what is necessary in a reliable way. Another place you find it, Romans chapter 16, verse 2. You remember chapter 16, verse 1 talks about the deaconess, Phoebe. He says, I commend to you, Phoebe, deaconess of Caesarea, that she needs some assistance. So in verse number 2, he says, I want you to help her in her work. And her work is pragma, the pragma. He says, I want you to assist other people in pragmatic, practical ways. That's what missions is all about, isn't it? The habit of giving to missions. But see, I want you to take from this a very important meaning. God wants you personally to have the habits that you need to accomplish what is necessary in your life in a reliable way. But God also wants you to have the habits that you need to help others accomplish what is necessary in their lives in a reliable way. God wants you to be so practical, have such good habits in your life, you are really living a successful life personally, but you are also helping other people become successful. Isn't that awesome? And I'm not talking about gobs of money success. I am talking about the real things that matter. Having successful relationships. Living successfully in the way that they relate with people. Living successfully in their personal character. Living successfully in taking care of themselves physically. Doing the things, the habits that you need to accomplish what's really necessary. The important things in life. God wants it for you, and he wants you to have it to also help others. Isn't that cool? I want to encourage you in a few different ways here. Just be financially pragmatic. You need that. You need financial pragmatism. The crown money map that I've given you in the past, if you haven't looked at that, I would encourage you again to go through the crown money map. God wants you to make healthy decisions. And really, the parable of the talents really is incorporating that, isn't it? God wants you to have financial habits that you need to accomplish what is necessary in a reliable way. God wants you to have intelligent, wise use of your finances, having financial habits where you are not destroying yourself, but building things. You need to learn to delay gratification to build for the future. Instead of living like we talked previously, not living by being impulsive and impatient, but instead making healthy, wise choices, God wants you to have the habit where you are delaying gratification, building for the future, making good decisions. Don't create financial duress. And I see some people do it to themselves. Now, when we went to buy our house, the one here in town, I think we paid about 42000 for it. Now, the bank said at that point we could have borrowed up to like $150,000. And we could have, and many people do. They buy as much as they can borrow. We said, no, 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 no. We're not going to buy as much house as we can we're going to buy within what we think is financially wise. And instead of spending three or four times what we did, what the bank said they would loan us, we made sure we bought 
conservatively. You know what? If we wanted to take the kids out to Mac and Don's Golden Rainbow Lounge, also known as the Golden Arches Supper Club, <laughs> we didn't have to think twice about it. It was like, that's no big deal. Why? Because we were not house poor. You understand that concept? Where somebody's paying so much money for their house, they don't have any money left over for other things. Don't put yourself in financial dress. Don't buy stuff on a credit card thinking, I'll just pay it back over several months, and you will be paying obscene amounts of interest. Don't put yourself in financial duress. You need instead, make sure you're tithing. That's the most important habit in your finances. Tithe, save money, invest. Make healthy decisions financially. And I want you to be relationally pragmatic. I want you to do the things necessary, have good relationship habits that you need to accomplish what's necessary in a reliable way. I want you to have good habits like we find in How to Win Friends and Influence People. If you haven't read it for a while, it'd be good to do a reread on that this year. I want you to have the habits that will lead you to personally being relationally successful, to have happy, healthy marriages, incredible friendships, Building relationships that are solid and stable and lasting and meaningful. Be relationally pragmatic. Have the right habits to accomplish what you need in a reliable way. I want you to also be spiritually pragmatic. To develop godly habits that you need to accomplish what is necessary in a reliable way. You want to have a healthy relationship with God, you need to be spiritually pragmatic. What kind of habits? Well, you need to be doing devotions every day. Every day have that habit of, I'm just going to spend time in the Word of God, I'm going to read some of the Scriptures, and I'm going to pray. And you do it every single day. You've established that as a healthy habit in your life. And already you've t- demonstrated this morning, you are doing something else really important. You are in church. You have shown up today to put God first in your life, to give Him the first part of the first day of the week. You are spiritually pragmatic this morning. Awesome. God bless you. Thank you for being so faithful. Now keep that up. Keep that up. Keep it up. I want you to live a biblically pragmatic lifestyle. A biblically pragmatic lifestyle means that you are doing like Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 tells us. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly to love mercy and walk humbly with your God. If I could summarize that very quickly. Some people, they're all about justice, but they have no mercy. They think, you know, you can't give people things because then they won't take responsibility for their own lives. And they're just harsh and mean about it, and that is just so ungodly. But then there are equally ungodly people that want to just give people everything but not make those people responsible, and then those people have no meaning or value and no don't want to work. Why would they work? They have it for free. That's mercy without justice. They need to be together. You need to do justly and love mercy. You need to help people in ways that will help them help themselves. You need to help them with incredible love and compassion and concern for their lives. And how do you do that? The third thing that's so important, to walk humbly with your God. And not have an arrogance on, look what I have done with my life. No, look what God has so graciously given you the ability to do. Because it's God who gives the ability to accumulate wealth. That's from the Pentateuch. It's in the Scriptures. God is the one who gives you the ability. Don't you think it's all from you? You need to be humble and walk humbly with your God. Well... I want you to take a stand. I want you to cherish every single moment you have and not let anybody steal your joy. And I want you to live a biblically pragmatic life. I want you to have the habits that you need to accomplish what's necessary in a reliable way. Why? Because some people don't finish their work. 
before their course is done. How much time do you have left? I've got 24%. Every sip needs to be treasured. And I need to realize, and you need to realize, your life could be poured out and you can't gather that back again. Don't waste those days. Treasure those days. And make sure you are ready when you run out of days. The scripture says it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that comes judgment. Stand with me as I prepare to close the service, and I want you to prepare your heart in this moment. Close your eyes, if you would, please. Close your eyes. I don't want anyone looking around, because this is a moment for you to reflect on your life and where you are at. Because like water spilt to the ground, your life could be over. And you need to answer a very important question. If your life was spilt to the ground today, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven? Are you absolutely sure if you were to die today that you would go to heaven? If you're not sure of that, then this is the moment where you need to make sure of it by having Jesus be Savior and Lord in your life. If you are not sure that you would go to heaven if you died today, I want you, I'm gonna, not going to embarrass you. I'm going to keep you right where you are and pray with you. But if you're not sure that you would go to heaven if you died today, slip your hand up. Put your hand up, and I'm going to pray with you this morning. Anyone? And those of you that are watching at home as well, if you are not sure that you would go to heaven if you died today, And I want to pray with you. I'm going to ask you right now to pray this right out loud with me and say, Dear Jesus, you are the one who died for me. You paid for my sin. I don't deserve that because I am a sinner. But you must really love me that you would sacrifice everything for me. I want to tell you here and now, I am sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for the times I've violated your word. I don't want that in my life anymore. I repent of my sin. And I'm putting my faith in you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life and be the Savior of my life and be the Lord of my life so that I don't waste my days. I surrender my life to you and I thank you for it. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Now help me live my life treasuring every moment, cherishing the present, being wise about the future, using my days wisely, enjoying the moments you give me, and making choices that will please you. To live my life with the right habits that will accomplish what's necessary in a reliable way. And I thank you for it, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for again sharing this time together with me. I certainly have enjoyed encouraging you, and I trust that this has really helped you to look at life so that you can live your life to the very fullest that God wants for you, of course, because God has 
God has sent his son that you might have life and that more abundantly. That's what John 10, 10 says. But in order for you to really be ready to live, you have to have grappled with, dealt with, and overcome the issue of death. Death can leave people with such trepidation in life that they're afraid to live. Well, God doesn't want you to be afraid of death because Jesus faced it head on. And you may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but Jesus defeated death. And because of his victory, you have victory too. Well, during this time, we also, at the end of the message, gave people an opportunity, of course, to get their hearts right with God, to be ready to die so they can be ready to live. Coming up both in mid-March and also on Easter Sunday, we're going to be doing something incredibly special, baptism. And we do it just like they did in the Bible, just like when they would go down to the River Jordan and they would be immersed in the water. We probably don't want to cut a hole in the ice for that. <laughs> so we have a mikveh. That's just like the Jewish uh, bath that they had where they would go down into for ceremonial cleansing. It's really just like a, a giant tub that has warm water in instead of icy chilled frozen lake water. But you can, of course, come and be a part of this incredible baptism experience and make that opportunity your own to be baptized just like in the Bible and to make your confession of faith in Christ. And I encourage you to do that. Now, if you're like me, you may have been baptized as a baby. And that's a good thing as far as parents dedicating you to the Lord and recognizing that you need God within your life, that's commendable. But the Bible calls us to what is called a believer's baptism, a baptism that is a decision that you make for yourself to demonstrate your own choice, your own decision to follow Jesus in your life. So I encourage you, if you want to be baptized just like in the Bible, come and we'll talk and we'll give you that opportunity. I'm so glad we've had this chance to be together. And I'd love to have you here with us in person. Please, please come and join in with the family. Sundays, 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. If you're not able to make it in person, I encourage you to watch online. The services are available live. And we'd love to know that you're also out there and you're part of our watching, our viewing, our, our extended family, if you will. Because we want you to be included. You're important. You're a treasure. Well, let us know you are experiencing the blessings of sharing this time with us. And I'd love to hear from you. Until we are together in person, this is your friend, Pastor Mark, reminding you God loves you so much, and so do I.